we begin this new series in the strength of the Lord and our first message from Moses to Joshua taken from Joshua chapter 1 and verses 1 to 9 it was a momentous time of transition for the people of Israel they have spent 40 years in the wilderness and God is going to bring them to the promised land. The year was 1405 BC and it was also the year when Moses died at the age of 120. He had been leading the people of God for the last 40 years as they wandered in the wilderness and there at the critical time of their entry to the promised land, we read from our text that Moses died. And how will Israel claim their inheritance to possess the land? They are a people now with a constitution the law given to them at Mount Sinai and rehearsed to them. As you read the text, you realize that the first four books of the Bible from Genesis, which is the book of beginnings, and Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, all the three books begin with the word and to show us a continuity in the four books, but when you come to the book of Deuteronomy, it seemed to begin afresh and as you read the book of Joshua you would see there the word N translated now in our King James Bible to speak of a continuity in the second giving of the law, the book of Deuteronomy, begins the preparation of God's people to inherit the land. And you would see this from Deuteronomy all the way, eight books, a continuous section to describe the history of God's people with a people, with a constitution, and now the land. Israel will become a full-fledged witness for the almighty God on earth. The nation was in mourning. This was the scene that comes before us. They mourned for 30 days. This was the Moses whom God called at the burning bush. This was the man whom God has chosen to be the leader for his people. He was a man whom the Spirit of God rested mightily the man whom God spoke face to face. This book of Joshua covers 30 years. If you take a peek at the end, you would see that Joshua would die at the age of 110. And so 40 years was he when he came out of Egypt together with the rest of the men the rest of the families and he had spent 40 years in the wilderness now at the age of 80 God has deemed fit that Israel will enter the land this is a new beginning and he was the man at the helm it was a great loss For Moses was Israel's deliverer. The Lord had used him in answer to prayer. You remember when we begin the book of Exodus, the people cried out by reason of their bondage in Egypt. And there, how the Lord prepared the baby. We were having our young adults fellowship yesterday and we spoke about Moses' mother. How God used this woman to 
keep safe the baby that was born against the decree of Pharaoh to kill all the male child that were born at that time and how he was put on the ark and Miriam, the daughter, Moses' sister, was there watching the ark till Pharaoh's daughter picked it up. And there he became Pharaoh's daughter. And mother was given wages to take care of this son who was destined at first to, throw, to be thrown into the river now. But he survived and thrived in the palace of Pharaoh. How the Lord worked things miraculously. This was the man who had courage to confront Pharaoh and his administration, the superpower on earth at the time. An absolute monarch with the mightiest army. How the people of God were withheld in servitude and how the Lord sent the man and how the Lord by, the, by his power confounded Pharaoh by ten plagues, the last plague on all the firstborn in Egypt, men and cattle, including Pharaoh's firstborn. This was the man by the strength of the Lord saw the outstretched rod parted the Red Sea. Behind was Pharaoh's army fast closing in. In front of them, the Red Sea parted to provide an impossible path for them. That night, Israel walked on dry land across the Red Sea, escaping the wrath of the Egyptian army. Dear friends, this is life with God. He delivered us from the clutches of evil, of bondage. Each one of us has a story to tell, isn't it? How the Lord delivered us and showed us the good way. And this was the Moses who composed the song to praise the Almighty God for His mercy when he said, I will sing unto the Lord, for He had triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song. He is become my salvation. He is my God. This was the Moses whom God had taken home at the age of 120. And you can imagine the time, the eulogy during the mourning period, how the people would have recounted his life. The writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 11 described Moses as a man of faith. He trusted God and God gave him the victory. Indeed, this was a man who understood well that with God is victory and without God, nothing. This was a man who had denied himself taken up the cross and walked with God. By faith, it is described by the writer of Hebrews, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. This is what made Moses special. He loved God and he loved God's people. Moses was special because God put that love in Moses' heart. He loved God and God's people and he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, the writer of Hebrews wrote, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt you can imagine the treasures in Egypt. It was the superpower of the day, how the Pharaoh built the pyramid, one of the great wonders of the world. 
They had everything. That was Egypt at that time. And it's described for us how he overcame, denied the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. He trusted God, the invisible God. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as a dry land, which the Egyptians assailing to do were drowned. This was the man whom the people remembered fondly, a man of faith, a man whom they murmured and complained to in their discontentment, the man who listened to complaints and provided a godly solution. The Bible called him the meekest man on earth. He was very meek because he was a man who depend on God, a man who trusted not him in himself, but trusted God and knew in himself that there is nothing good. It was God's appointed time that Moses should die and that he should rest from his labours. As we think about life, as we think about how much time we have ahead of us, uh, we think not really uh, uh, very optimistically, isn't it? Because we know that the body is weak. And we realize how weak we are. But we also know by the grace of God, He has given us this life. And though there are many infirmities that are in us, where He endued us with life, let us do His bidding. For if He had endued us with a mission, with a purpose, let us discharge it for His honour and for His glory. So God's people recounted the life of Moses and they knew in their hearts that His work would follow Him. And now God has chosen Joshua to receive the mentor from Moses to lead God's people to possess the land of their inheritance. This man has grown up under Moses' care and the care of God. Joshua was nurtured and prepared by God to this work. In Deuteronomy 34, it's described for us from chapter 9, verse 9 to 12. And Joshua, the son of Nun, or son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him, as did the Lord commanded Moses. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel, like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, in all the signs and the wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and all his servants and to all his land and in all that mighty hand and in all the great terror which Moses showed in the sight of all Israel. Three thoughts for our meditation. The baton, verse 1 to 4. The unction, verse 5 to 6 and 9. And the scriptures, verse 7 to 8. Now, after the death of Moses, the text tells us, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan, thou and all the people, unto the land which I give to them, even to the children of Israel. In a race, when the baton has been passed, the runner who receives the baton 
must run immediately. He is the man at the moment. All the eyes are upon him. He must run the best he knows how. The work of possessing the promised land was the work that God had been preparing Joshua to undertake with or without his knowledge. It became very clear to him at the close of Moses' life. Who was this man, Joshua? Verse, chapter 1 and verse 1 tells us that he was the son of Nun, Moses' minister. This man learned how to obey as a servant before he commanded as a general. He was Moses' helper. And there was no mention of his father, Nun, in the scriptures. We can deduce that his father and mother were slaves along with all the, people, all the Israelites there in Egypt. They were victims of Pharaoh's taskmasters. Life was hard. He could see his parents toiled under the rigors of Pharaoh's, in Pharaoh's regime. And when he's older, he too became a slave. He was there on the dreadful night of the first Passover when he as the firstborn in his family was spared. It was told to us in First Chronicles 7 and verse 27. It was the night Israel could not forget. The death angel came to slay the firstborn in Egypt, both man and beast. He must have heard the mournful wail of the Egyptian parents piercing through the night. The terror of the Lord. How Pharaoh was persuaded in small degrees to acquiesce to the Lord and how he was disobedient and the wrath of God came stronger and stronger, heavier and heavier. How thankful Joshua must have been to be among the living, those who marched triumphantly out of Egypt, following their leader, Moses. He was, in Joshua's heart, the ideal role model. He knew Moses' faith and courage when he confronted Pharaoh and pronounced judgment on Egypt. Of course, we know the weakness of the man, how he was so reluctant, how he was so unwilling because he understood what it was to confront the terror that was in the known world that day, that day. But he saw also the results of great faith and courage as plague after plague came upon Egypt. The Nile was changed to blood, followed by the plague of frogs, the nets, the insects, the pestilence, the boils, the hails, the locusts, and great darkness. And finally, finally, the death of the firstborn. And so our text tells us that here Moses is dead and now arise and go over this Jordan. Moses must have confidence in this man Joshua because it was the Lord who spoke to him. Our text in verse 1 says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua. Before that, Moses would speak to him 
You recall when Joshua first appeared in the Old Testament, it was in the book of Exodus and chapter 17. And that was the scene when, as a young lieutenant, he was called upon to fight, to lead an army at Rephidim against the Amalekites. And there, you recall, Moses was up in the mountain praying, and there he was fighting the battle. When Israel arrived at the wilderness, God gave them the law, and it was Joshua that was with Moses in the mountains. Exodus 24 tells us, Moses rose up, and Joshua his minister, and Moses went up into the mount. Joshua 20, uh, Exodus 24 and verse 13. There he was, following close by. Mo Joshua may not have experienced God's glory to the same degree as Moses did, but he did enjoy great access to God's presence. He alone was allowed to continue up in the mountain. And we are told in Exodus 33 verse 11 that the, when the Lord spoke to Moses face to face, there was Joshua together with him, for he departed not out of the tabernacle. At that time, the tabernacle has been railed up and there he was with them. He was Moses' right-hand man. And it was a unique relationship. If Joshua would have known at the time what God had in store for him, he would have lost perspective just knowing that eventually God is going to ask him to do an impossible task. How would he have handled it psychologically? Well, we see that only God knows the future. And how the Lord in his providential timing unveils his sovereign plan, his incomprehensible way by which he leads his people. It was Joshua who was among the 12 spies sent out to survey the land. And how they came back to give the account of the survey. We came unto the land, Numbers 13. Whether thou, whither thou sendest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. But there the other ten spies said, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land. And they said, There we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, which were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. It was a grave moment when Moses and Aaron fell before the assembly of the congregation and Joshua and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, to search the land, rent their clothes. They understood the battle that was before them. They understood the heart of God. What was the will of God for His people? They were to enter the land, but they did not. And that was why we are here in this scene 40 years later. You can see that the man at the outset demonstrated spiritual maturity and faith. They dared to confront the congregation of the sons of Israel. Sadly, the children of Israel did not listen 
and they rose up against Joshua and Caleb and tried to stone them. This was the background before this scene that we have when God would give to him his life mission. And Moses would give to him these final words in Deuteronomy 31, verse 7 to 8. Will you turn there with me? Deuteronomy 31 and verses 7 to 8. And Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of a good courage, for thou must go with this people unto the land which the Lord has sworn unto their fathers to give them, and thou shalt cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he it is that goeth before thee, he will be with thee, he will not fail thee, neither forsake thee. Fear not, neither be dismayed. We learn how the Lord would prepare the man and we saw how the Lord delineated him for the task. It was, he was first to survey the land and now 40 years later he would be told to now go into the land. The baton has been passed. Joshua has been given the commission. He is now charged to go in and possess the land. You notice the action verbs arise and go. Two imperatives, two commands. Joshua has learned obedience all his life. That at the command of God, he is to act. He is not to go in any other direction. The Lord would give the command and he must follow. And for a man to be filled with the Spirit of God so that at every turn, every word from the Lord, he is to see and to act immediately. Indeed, God knew the heart of this man and how he, he by his spirit, enabled to do what he would be doing. Verse 3, Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread, that have I given you. As I said unto Moses, from the wilderness of this Lebanon, even unto the great river, from the river Euphrates, and all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. God has promised that he will fight for Israel. He will give them the victory. They are to go in faith, to depend on His strength. When we begin our Christian life, we begin this journey of usefulness for God. The things that we do by faith can now be counted precious in God's sight in eternity. We begin our walk with exercising that faith that God has placed in our heart to follow Him, allowing it from a spark to kindle into be a fire burning out for the Lord. What was Moses' secret of success? The Lord revealed it to Joshua. This is the second and the third thought. The unction, verse 5 to 6. And the scriptures, verse 7 to 9, the unction, verse 5, There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will 
be with thee, I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Joshua saw how God was with Moses, how Moses triumphed in the power of God. The secret of Moses' success was God's presence with him. This second thought is carried also in verse 9. Have I not commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage? Dear brethren, Joshua needed more than strategic planning to accomplish God's purposes. He needed God. And God is assuring Joshua of his abiding presence with him. Just as the Lord, when he gave the commission to his disciples to go forth, he also tells them that he will be with them. And what does it mean, dear friends, to have God abiding with you? That God will fight your battles. That he will be with you and that if the enemy were to come, the Lord himself will stand in between. He will stand before us as his shield, as our shield, as our protector. He is with us because the battle was grave. They were facing giants, formidable enemies beyond their might. You remember they were not an army. They didn't have weapons. They didn't have proper weapons. And how could they fight? The key was not Joshua's military skills, but in God's powerful presence. The anointing of the Holy Spirit makes all the difference. And this was so for the early church. The disciples were fearful and disillusioned, but God's Spirit came mightily upon them and they were able with boldness and courage to preach the gospel. The power of God was manifested in the infant church and many souls were saved. In Peter's first preaching, 3,000 were converted. Verse 5, There shall not a man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Of course, Joshua was concerned. In front of him was the flooding banks of the Jordan River. They had no rafts, no means against this overwhelming tide. How will they cross the river? And then they would conf be confronted with the military might of the enemies that were in the land. Joshua had surveyed the land. He knew the odds. Well, the counsel was given to Joshua and to keep relying on the Lord. Turn with me to Isaiah 26, verse 3 and 4. Isaiah 26, verse 3 and 4. It says here, Thou shalt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusted in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever. For in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. God gave to Joshua the greatest assurance he could give. I will not leave thee for, nor forsake thee. The Lord said to the disciples, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. What does it mean? Dear friends, you are given a promise from God the Almighty God. And you take hold of that promise and you know that God is true to His Word 
And every time you come to an impasse, dear friends, when we come to an impasse in life, the formidable roadblock that is before us, how do we overcome? Uh, that's where we realize that we have the Lord with us. The Lord has given Himself to us. And we are to remember what He had done, what He did for us. And so for the disciples, you remember there was one time when Jesus walked on the water and Peter was asked to come out and walk. And our text gives to us in Matthew 14, verse 29 to 31, Jesus said to Peter, Come! And when he came down out of the ship, he walked on water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink and he cried, Lord, save me! And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Dear friends, this work that God entrusted to his church as it was God's kingdom in Israel, they were to possess the land. What does it mean to possess the land? Well, the enemy had to be taken out in order for them to possess the land. Today, we are waiting for the Lord Jesus Christ to come. The Word of God tells us that when our Lord Jesus Christ would come, He would possess the land. The earth will be in His possessions. The enemies would be taken out. We are to trust Him while we bring forth the gospel to, to the uttermost parts of the earth. For when we do so, He will come. And there we are given the promise that we would reign with Him in eternity. What a promise that He gives us while we do His work here. As it were, feeble people in the midst of great darkness that is coming upon the earth. We can feel and understand the presence of a world that is soon going to be engulfed And it's as if we are helpless for all the things that are happening before us today. Well, dear friends, we are not. The Lord is still on the throne. And the Lord is with us that we must know it so that we will be strong and we will be courageous and that we will not fear what would come upon us? What make the difference? The unction of the Spirit of God. Numbers 27 verse 18 says, And the Lord said to Moses, Take thee Joshua the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thy hand upon him. This is the unction that makes all the difference. Joshua was repeatedly assured by the Lord. It was Joshua's willingness to trust God's wisdom rather than his own knowledge. Imagine a group of unarmed people. You are asked to possess a land filled with giants. How impossible it is but by the unction of the Holy Spirit. The spirit of wisdom is a profound gift for those who desire and seek it. Those upon whom 
the spirit rests need not face situations with their own limited wisdom and understanding. We have the counsel and wisdom of God available to us. Isn't it so? You realize how you need God and how God can provide for us? He provided for us here a pulpit. We were looking for it. He provided for us a place, an auditorium, good seats for everyone, enough for everyone. How is it possible that we are coming to 10 years? How is it possible? Well, we say it is impossible, but it was the Lord, the Spirit of God, took him beyond mere knowledge and gave specific guidance to make wise decisions. The baton is the commission passed from Moses to Joshua, verse 1 to 4. And the unction, which is the assurance of God's abiding presence with him, as he was with Moses, so will he be with Joshua, verse 5 to 6. And most importantly, the scriptures, verse 7 to 9. The Holy Spirit always work in tandem with the word of God. And so we are given these words there. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left hand, to that that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. It's the Spirit of God that gives the illumination to understand the Scriptures, to appropriately help us in our lives. And verse 8 of our text says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. He is to be guided and governed wholly by the word of God what was written and given to him. And before Joshua, there was no such command because there was no such book. But for Joshua, Moses has recorded God's laws in his books. Likewise for us, he had five books. We have the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And it is indeed a decisive advantage, both on and off the battlefield. The difference is the unction of the Holy Spirit. So the scripture was said to be the supreme authority for him, and the scriptures were to be set above him. All his actions are to be regulated by him. And Moses commit this word to Joshua, just as Paul committed God's word to Timothy and asked Timothy to commit them to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. He was indeed tasked with a great responsibility, an army and the administration of a nation. How would he have time to meditate on anything? But here is given to us that he is to meditate upon the word of God. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. He is to take time in prolonged thought, in deep 
meditation so that God's command will not sound strange to our ears if we have not taken time not only to read it but to memorize it and having memorized it to internalize it so that each time when we are faced with a battle we will know what to do the word of God tells us you recall we were mentioning the Lord teach, teaching us during the church camp how we are to walk in the Spirit. To walk in the Spirit is to allow the Word of God to be brought to our reminder in our hearts in the moment of contention, at the time of temptation, at the time of trial. If you have taken time to meditate upon the Word of God, the Word of God will come to you. And at that time, you are to choose, to choose to obey. And if you choose to hearken to the Word of God, you are walking in the Spirit. For the Spirit of God will use the Word to guide you, to show you the way, to show you what's right, what's wrong. But if we have not the Word of God in our hearts, if we have not taken time to handle things so that, you know, in every role that we have in life, God's Word has provided for us the wisdom as a father, as a mother, in the workplace, God provides for us the blueprint for success for every family, isn't it? For every marriage, for every family represented in a nation, God gave the blueprint for success. And it's very doable. The trouble with us is that we don't take time to meditate. We don't take time to study. We don't take time to learn. And when we are faced with a decision, when we are faced with a challenge, the Word of God doesn't come to us. We don't know what to do. We do what's right in our own sight. That's the trouble with us and so here is given to us the command to take time to meditate upon the word of God meditation is focused concentration biblical meditation involves pondering God's word until he makes its full implication clear. It is staying upon God's presence until God has helped you to understand what His Word is saying to you. When we just scheme the surface of God's Word, it will not suffice us, not for a leader to bear the great responsibility if you are the head of a home, you have many whom God has placed in your hands to be responsible for and too much therefore is at stake. Only a careful, thoughtful period of meditation will ensure that you can grasp all the ramification of God's word for those you would lead. You need to think for them, isn't it? And how can you think for them? Well, you think for them according to God's thoughts. Paradoxically, we see that many are busy facing significant time pressures and so they assume that they have no time 
to meditate on God's word. Well, we are just praying concerning our family day this year. If God be willing to provide for us, we're going to spend time to consider and think and examine the lives and the writings of men of old, men of God who understood the things of God and who have thought through the matters concerning God's kingdom and how we ought to live our lives. And all this that was written left hidden to us. We hardly pick up anything to study, anything to read, anything to meditate upon. No wonder we are in trouble. And so we pray, God willing, that we would be able to gather together and to be able to uh, begin so that we would embark on a journey, on a deeper study of God's Word. Time is precious. And yet, the wisest thing is to be able to seek God's wisdom. Careful evaluation of God's Word is a must for the sake of everybody involved. And no crisis is too pressing to prevent us from seeking God's perspective. Wise leaders understand the importance of meditation. And they are proactive in scheduling time to focus uninterrupted on important issues. The Bible is a storehouse packed, fully packed with wisdom. And unpacking its treasures would take time. And God's Word holds the answers to what God's people need. God's Word would shed light on any situation. And so why should we ignore this treasury of wisdom? God told Joshua in verse 9, Have I not commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Was this important for him? Absolutely. He was about to attempt the impossible. And lives would depend on him. He needed God to give him the word so that the lives would be kept and preserved. And he is to meditate upon God's word, to be assured of God's presence. Do not be afraid. The enemy will threaten. The enemy will come as a roaring lion. And you must be able to stand firm in that moment of testing. We need to understand the enormity of this truth. How does it work out in your workplace? What does it mean when we are admitted to a hospital? What does it mean when everybody has abandoned us? How does this work in day-to-day -day situations? How can I know God hasn't forsake me when everything in my life seems to be going wrong. The Bible holds promises with enormous implications if we are to take time to consider their potential to change our lives. If you would take time, this is where the Lord would give us good 
success. The beaten, the ancient, the scriptures. Joshua knew his calling in life. He had the promise of God's abiding presence and his availing power through the Holy Spirit. And he has the compass of God's word as his guide. We too, God has given us, given to us as a church, his commission, the great commission. And he has charged us to courageously go and he will give us his divine blueprint for success in his word. We are to go forth and I pray that the Lord would indeed grant success as we endeavour to trust him and follow his guidance from this time forth and forevermore. By his mercy, may the Lord help us. Let us pray. Father, we thank thee for thy word. Strengthen us to know indeed that thou art with us. For we are thy people and thou art our God, the almighty God, as thou didst lead Israel in the most glorious period of their history to embark on the conquest of the land. May thou indeed help us as we begin this series in the strength of the Lord to reap, learn precious lessons for our life, for our less, less life lessons that we may be equipped for the challenges that thou hast for us in the days ahead. Strengthen thy people. This I pray with thanksgiving. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.